uh, just selling that these are the five points I would like to cover. I think that is what the task you gave me and sometimes it is also quite hard to separate one from the other. So, I am not going one by, uh, it is in that sequence, but you have sometimes uh, the thoughts are overlapping also, you know. So, we have to recognize how this uh, program is started and I just uh, heard few points uh, which you all have to think about in any program you are putting, you know. So, uh, it started in the 1940s, uh, uh, Dr. Borlaug came to Mexico and was associated with rust. So, this is, you know, kind of link with the, the rust workshop here. Uh, you, some of you know this famous Paxinia pathway, uh, where the rust was uh, surviving initially, let us say, in Mexico because of warmer conditions when crop was grown. So, you start to see disease appearing in Mexico, then moving to Texas and all the way to Canada as the temperatures were increasing. So, he was basically recruited to send to Mexico to see what he can do about the rust. And the, the, uh, so, so, that was the goal why he came. And so, so Dr. Bolo uh, very quickly that time uh, realized that if you have to grow resistant varieties. In those days, you can think about the chemicals were not so great either. So, the only way you could control rust was uh, uh, growing resistant variety and to develop resistant variety, he had the, uh, the most famous innovation, the shuttle breeding. And he even says, he was going to be fired because he innovated that. And why he was going to be fired? Because in those days, people believed that you have to breed a variety uh, where you are going to grow. You cannot breed uh, some other place. And he broke that uh, paradigm. So, it was a big paradigm shift, but he had to succeed also. Uh, and then the, and then I say also the opportunity case here, you know, he could have been, he, his stem rust resistant varieties started to come out in 1950 because of the shuttle breeding using two crop seasons, but he was not happy. He's, he heard about these dwarfing genes. So, he, he saw an opportunity here, he started to develop and, and, and you could say why. He was in the very high production zone of Yaki Valley in Sonora state where wheat was irrigated. So, the minute you put a better condition, the tall weeds will fall down. So, so he developed those uh, uh, semi dwarfs. And the other part very important and I hope we go back in that because all the restrictions which are coming up in germplasm sharing, if he had not shared those time, what would have happened? Just think about it. So, this uh, uh, sharing and international uh, testing came up and the importance of international testing uh, you can do in one year you can learn so much about the, your germplasm, which you might take you 15, 20 years to learn, you know, uh, on the yield stability, which is very important aspect, uh, aspect adaptation, tolerance to temperature in very short time. And, and, and then the capacity development, where many of you young guys are here, if you do not have the right capacity, you cannot progress. So, these are kind of principles we still follow. And uh, uh, Lee mentioned the CIMIT's program, big program. No, it is the, the international partnership which makes it uh, important and big enough. Uh, we are very small program if you think about, but when all the partners come together it really becomes a huge program and th and that's what is, is still important and we cherish that and we want to continue improving the partnership part and i think hans uh, in his talk is going to highlight later on uh, uh, because we many of you are growing this year 
the 50th International Breadweight Screening Nurseries in your country. So it's 50 years since the inception of CIMIT. It was, uh, before was other institution, uh, you, uh, I mean, germplasm was shared, but uh, as an institution is a 50 years now uh, for us sharing the germplasm. And, and because of that partnership, uh, which uh, has prospered very well and continues, uh, our set, uh, uh, the goal in Mexico at present is to target breeding for roughly 60 million hectares. And it's not just one environment, you know, it moves from irrigated, which is the largest 30 million hectares, high rainfall, to uh, drier areas and to irrigated warm areas. And, in, and also we have to uh, show that uh, what we, we do uh, with the partners is worthwhile. So they, every eight to 10 years, they do this uh, impact assessment. And uh, the main area where we target South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, West Asia and North Africa, if you see the blue part here, uh, that's roughly the uh, number of varieties which are released uh, coming directly. So it comes out on the average about 50% released varieties are uh, direct cement and uh, the other ones have uh, either uh, germplasm used as parent, that's the red part and the green part is the grandparent, you know. So, so it's, it's like uh, uh, you keep moving on with this. Uh, and, and to achieve that, you also have to set your priorities, what you want to achieve. You know? And uh, so what are the traits you are going to focus? Very often, uh, in some cases, you know the genes behind those traits, but may, very often in breeding programs, they uh, don't know the genes. Yeah. Uh, so the traits uh, uh, start off high and stable yields. That's in climate change scenario very important. Rust resistance because most areas we target fungicides are not used or people don't want to use uh, also because farmers are a small holder. Uh, uh, the, the water use efficiency or drought tolerance uh, becoming important too, even in the irrigated areas as water table going down, heat tolerance and use quality enhanced uh, zinc and iron content, which we are looking also now for nutrition. Uh, it's uh, largely for South Asia when we started, but some other areas being looked. Then de uh, depending on some uh, uh, the target mega environment, there are other diseases and these are the ones which we have some work or a lot of work being done. And these two are the, uh, some new things, wheat blast, you, you will hear more about it in South Asia. Our friends from uh, 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 South America, especially Brazil, Paraguay and uh, Bolivia, they uh, have already been uh, uh, battling with this disease, but now South Asia. And South Asia, when you think about it, is very large area. So, uh, also, I think this is one area we need to work more and more on the common aphids. Uh, they are becoming uh, quite important. We started some work, but if we, I say, if I had finished the rust uh, some time back, this would have been the <laughs> other one I would have myself tried to, uh, to work on. But we are lucky we have a young guy now, so he has long time to, uh, to focus on it. So the other part, you know, very often when we do research, we, you think about a trait very often, right? But when we, uh, when we think about uh, breeding, we don't just think about a trait. You have to deal with many traits. And when you are dealing with many traits, you are also thinking about many, many genes behind them. And that's where the whole complexity starts to show up in breeding program. How you manage all those uh, different uh, genes or traits or, or genes behind the traits together, you know, it's, uh, it's like keeping all those sheep in, in Australia, you know, 
are, are they herd together? So you think about a big herd of genes which you can very quickly lose if you are not careful. Yeah. Uh, just uh, and the, uh, to say very often this debate comes uh, on yield potential gain and I think uh, this uh, the discussion in uh, the breeding technology is more about the yield than some other trait because the yield is one of the most difficult trait which you have to target and breed for and progress is always slow. Uh, so one of the issues which we, we have been trying to look uh, in our program uh, for yield is what do we do in our uh, crossing and selection schemes uh, is, is basically to maximize the probability of identifying rare transgressive segregants because you have to look for outperformers not just performers, they are already there. These performers, the good varieties are there. The demand is to go beyond and even by a small, small margin. But that is what, if you want to win the race, this is what you have to look for, right? So you, you could do some refinement in your breeding scheme to adequately manage the highly quantitative genetic control. Yield my friend Pancho Crosa, uh, Jose, he is giving some other talk. He said yield you cannot predict basically, though he says with genomic model you can, but it's the issue of managing yield, grain yield is so challenging, right? So what we have been looking is uh, some at some stage optimizing the number of crosses and population sizes we have gone to what we call single back cross approach, not a yeah, single back cross means only uh, one back cross. If you make too many back crosses, you go back to where you started and that is not the idea, right? Then we have gone on this selection bulk, uh, selected bulk scheme uh, for handling large number of plants in segregating populations while you are still making uh, some gains from selection, right? And, and so some of the money which we have been saving in these stages allows us to spend on a large number of hedgerows or the individual plants derived F6, F7 and the yield testing. And uh, I still have not found a substitute for the yield testing and, and I think for some time until we understand very well the whole wheat genome, uh, you have to go through that. All other traits uh, can tell you that line is going to have higher yield, but at the end you still need to test. Right? So the, the other part, because you want to continuously make progress, you have to think about a targeted introduction of new genetic diversity. And in, uh, in the climate change scenario, uh, there was a question on nighttime temperature you were discussing, the stress tolerance. When temperature goes up, the water requirement of plant also goes up. So you cannot deal one and forget about the other. You have to deal both together nowadays. So the more of this uh, stress tolerant trait you put with the yield potential, the varieties performance and the yield stability improves. So that is what you are looking for. So we do some of these things uh, like targeted utilization of improved winter weeds and land races. Matthew described some uh, in the physiology program, uh, uh, this use of synthetic wheat uh, uh, is still continues uh, in cement and many other people are using alien translocations or others uh, which you need to bring in. You know, uh, how many people will know, many of you may have heard about the 1B1R translocation, right? Which is the other translocation you think is becoming very widespread? <laughs> huh? No. <laughs> 
uh, Philomene has the answer. Uh, uh, they, they call some people call 2NS. It's the VPM uh, translocation uh, you'll find in uh, many breeding program. Australia, CIMIT, US, Europe, the frequency of that translocation is very quickly increasing. In CIMIT germplasm, uh, what is 70, 80 percent of the new lines already have, and we are lucky that we had that translocation because it also has a gene for uh, partial resistance to blast, wheat blast. So, so anyway, you know, many times these things are not known. <laughs> But they are getting selected after one B one R. That is uh, the translocation, and we need to find more translocation, which can give you some useful traits. Yeah. So, so main challenge in breeding technology you have is how well and quickly these are achieved. You know all these, and and that's what gives you success or failures. So in CIMIT, we the upscaling and breeding uh, and testing in our case, and I also know you cannot uh, the experience from one breeding program you cannot just go and apply in in your own. So you have to figure out what functions well for you, and depending on the breeding program size, you also. Uh, you have to develop your own uh, 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 your own plans and schemes how you want to progress so one uh, often what i noticed people are very proud of telling how many crosses we make right in cement also we had uh, people saying we make 15000 crosses we, the, uh, at one time but then my you know, after what I have been thinking, my next question is, how many lines do you test in your breeding, uh, in your yield trial? And, uh, you know, people say, I make 1,000 crosses, but I test 100 lines in the yield trial. You know there is some distortion. You should be making maybe 100 crosses and testing 1,000 lines. You say, otherwise, it's, you know, why are you making crosses? just for the sake of making crosses. Anyway, so, so we, we changed and we kind of came to a, a better balance and I'll share some information. The other learning is the parents. If you don't start off with right parents, do, the probability of getting good progeny has gone. And you have to make, as I say, very often winning cross combination. That's, what you have to have in the back of your mind. So, uh, germplasm exchange and information, both are important nowadays. Okay, uh, I mentioned here planters, combines, etc., which uh, you need. Some of the physiological traits you can use, uh, and there are nice devices uh, for the selection. And, uh, then uh, the integration of high throughput phenotyping and genomic selection. We are still uh, uh, in the process of testing where it suits the best because I think you heard Philomene, you talked yesterday. It's not that simple. And, and you have to figure out where and how and, and cost also because they are not cheap either. Uh, so, so just when we talk about efficiently managing breeding population, this selected bulk scheme has worked very well for us. Why? Because we can, uh, I mean, these are, I don't think you will see the numbers, but later on you can look at it. Uh, between uh, different segregating populations, we have close to 2 million plants in the field. We are not that many people, you know. Uh, uh, to go through so uh, you and harvest and manage so you have to come up with a simpler scheme and that's where the selected bulk has worked out very well and uh, these are numbers you know uh, for managing just keep uh, that two million number in in back of your mind why I'm mentioning uh, 
and of course, rapid cycling uh, uh, two, two generations per year, uh, probably from uh, what Lee will say is not very, uh, very speedy anyway. But uh, when you manage large number, uh, uh, managing that is also very cumbersome for people, you know, uh, uh, together with other things. And, and then we, uh, because of UG99 stem rust, we also expanded our shuttle uh, from Mexico, two sites, to going to Kenya, growing there uh, for two seasons and bringing back to Mexico. So that is how it's working uh, for us. And, and, and also, please remember that each selection in the field, you are adding to genetic gain for more than one trade, because uh, when you grow in the field, you are looking for plant height, uh, fertility in the spike, leaf health, uh, even some level of lodging tolerance sometimes, materials uh, if they lodge you throw. So then, uh, of course, d uh, resistance to diseases, when you harvest, you look at the grain. So there are many, many traits you are selecting. You are not uh, just growing and advancing. So we also do a lot of phenotyping for uh, yield and this season uh, while we are enjoying here, the meeting our other colleagues are <laughs> busy uh, harvesting and sending data for analysis and selection, so it's all going on. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, usually between nine to 10,000 new entries in the first year yield trial. Uh, uh, and we grow that under high yield conditions, sec and the best uh, around uh, 1,092. This number we have fixed it now, because so when you we put in the second year trial, the seed multiplication also starts uh, for shipment purpose. This we are doing under six environments now, uh, and these are replicated too uh, from. Uh, uh, quite dry conditions uh, to high production environments, uh, heat stress environments. So all this gets used later on for uh, selection. And uh, those who, who work uh, closely uh, as a part of the International uh, Wheat Improvement Network, uh, uh, we are so indebted that all these trials and nurseries which are send, we get a lot of data back. It's, it can be improved, by the way, because recovery right now is around 60%. I hope we can recover 80% at least data every year for the trials and nurseries which we send out. So, so this is basically the kind of program which is running now. You have to see what do I do or what I don't do to something which is uh, working for the last so many years. So there have been changes and refinements in the selection schemes, et cetera. Uh, so I, I go one by one and come to the real topic now. So what are the practical considerations and uh, limitations to implementing new technologies? So if I am sitting there, Right now, as the leader of the program, I have to think about it, yeah? So, uh, so first thing you have to think about is the size of the breeding program. Uh, in wheat, most programs I still call they are a small uh, or medium size. It's not like uh, Monsanto's corn program, which may be 20 times bigger than the Simits uh, wheat breeding program on its own, you know. Uh, and it's largely in public sectors. So the minute you think about public sector, you know how hard it's to even get through the, all the process you want to make change. You need the funds, you need the uh, implementation, you want to buy something. Uh, it, it's not, right from there, it's not simple. And that's why you have to somehow break that. Most programs run with low budget, fewer the staff, but with large expectations. This is other thing. 
the cost of infrastructure operation and new professionals with different skills. So, I want to change for example, to genomic selection they say. So, we had to do for the, well we had Jessica Rutowski for a few years and then now we have Philomene. So, you have to add a person who really understands what genomic selection is. Do not expect that somebody like me with a more a different skill, I will become a genomic selection breeder. It does not happen that way. So, you have to uh, build that capacity. Uh, then new technologies are not cheap either. So, when we talk of new technologies and also what we find, you take a marker platform as an example. I started working with people uh, with uh, SSR markers came much later, but uh, RFLPs, uh, then uh, uh, rapids, then uh, uh, AFLPs came and I mean it is just why time you try to, so we I have seen so many labs which are abundant now, because they are, you cannot keep up with uh, technology, you know the cost of the technology and new new technologies, uh, they, they one machine you know sequencer, you have to invest a lot of money. So, that is another issue which we face in cement and I bet many other people also face. So, you have to find around and of course, outsourcing is one option nowadays and that is why you know labs are only you extract maybe DNA. Over promise. It is not what is said always comes out. So, uh, in the 90s, I felt very kind of what the hell we are doing. You know, when uh, people uh, in molecular breeding will say, oh, molecular breeding, is, I, I do not want to put a name, but very important person uh, uh, said that in UK will replace field, field based selection in less than a decade. Okay? Sorry, Matthew, that was uh, somebody high up in UK. <laughs> so, you can think about those, those days who that was and that was hurting us in that time to obtain funding for the work, because uh, funds were moved uh, towards the molecular side and we know where we are right now. Uh, consumer acceptance like uh, GM wheat, CRISP, okay, CRISPR-Cas9 is the solution right now is it really? So, that is the question you have to ask and then you make the investment. Okay? Everyone is investing in cement, we have people working on it too, but I do not know whether uh, right now I do not know is a magic bullet or not. Okay, and the last one, the most important one, if something is working, why do you want to change? So, uh, and I think it is important especially for the breeding programs, because breeding programs the result you know after many years. So, and that overlap you have to maintain at least until you figure out the new thing you are doing is really helping you and in a cost effective way or at least it is giving you higher genetic gains. So, so, I mentioned some of the technologies which very quickly are wide, uh, wide, uh, widely adopted. It is like the sewing machines, you know planters, I think you can find practically everywhere, but still some places hand planting is very common, threshers and plot combines. Electronic weighing machines, uh, you know uh, connected to computers for automated data transfer statistical tools for analyzing results, field book management system you will find, databases and Excel, you know I am Excel user because in CIMIT we have gone from one database option to other database. By time a database comes you find it has limitation, it cannot use the marker data anymore. So, we, 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 we use a lot of Excel and there is no harm, I say there is no harm even in using Excel than not using anything. Uh, okay, handheld tablets now, 
uh, for recording data in the field. This is very quickly, our assistant now in the field, they don't carry a field book, they're carrying the tablets and putting the data in. So you can uh, very, very quickly see barcodes, printers. So these are some simpler technologies, but uh, some are costly, like uh, plot combines, they are costly, uh, but uh, I think people are realizing the benefit you want to do more phenotyping for real without combine, you cannot do. So in marker-assisted breeding, uh, in almost 25 years now since uh, we started working, they, I have summarized here the way uh, most places you find it's being used now because I think it has found its uh, real place. Profiling of parents for more informed crossing incorporating new disease or stress tolerance genes in breeding gene pool, pyramiding of uh, resistance genes, most of the time that's where it's used, incorporating translocations to enhance diversity, selecting genes in the absence of diseases, pest and stress. Uh, so the issues we, we look at it, is it benef uh, uh, beneficial if marker cost lower than the phenotyping cost. So you don't have to always think of using marker. First you can do a quick uh, field screening, only resistant material, then you go and figure out what genes you might be carrying uh, rather than, than doing otherwise. So in our case, it still is at $2 per line cost, you know, for each uh, gene you want to uh, know about it. Uh, Okay, the other, in case of it, we still have only few useful genes which are reliable markers, and that is very challenging for wheat people. Uh, then also we realize that uh, marker predict the genotype, but final phenotype in many cases is determined by other genes in the background, even so-called the major genes. You know, uh, RST, you know, famous RST dwarfing genes, RST 1 and 2. You can find lines which are 20 centimeters shorter, and you can find lines with 20 centimeters taller. So you are talking big range of variation, even with lines which have RST genes. So if you don't go in the field, you lose out uh, the right height which you are looking for. And to me, in the longer run, is the over-dependence on few genes with markers could lead to loss of latent diversity maintained through field selection. It's very important. Whenever we talk, uh, okay, people are, what resistance genes do you have, just for example? Very often, we know only a small bit of it. Some people get very concerned. I'd say this is better because you have much more still to figure out. That means there is more diversity out there than we know. What is better? <laughs> For me, it's different. Anyway, so uh, I said, uh, so this technology is playing role. In case of SIMID at present, uh, we have close to 22 different genes which we are in, uh, introducing in our breeding gene pool through marker assisted breeding I listed. These, uh, most of these genes have uh, uh, quite reliable markers, so, so they are uh, for breeding purpose quite useful. A speed breed, breeding for cements is spring wheat. We have a lot of discussion. We had, uh, we went through a Gates Foundation uh, based review last year, a lot of discussions occur. And uh, so this is a summary point, uh, and uh, maybe Lee can help us later on uh, in our thought process, uh, how and where and what should we do. I will come to show you later on what we plan to do in our case. So we said two generations per year is speed breeding, but not a high speed of five, six generations per year. So, so the now issue goes, how many generations per year for the normal breeding do you really need? Okay, this is the big question coming. When do you start? Uh, 
in our case F1 top class generation we grow F2, F3, F4 that's then, then you do not have to grow after that. So, you or you go F2, F3, F4 if you are using simple cross. F5 you can grow in the field because you probably want more seed to, uh, to have. So, I need in one year either 4 or 3 generation. In fact, you I mean this think back again, do we really need to reach up to F5 or F6 and then take the individual plant? you can do individual uh, in F4 generation you can take the individual plant uh, if I use the selected bar there is enough homozygosity already you just increase your uh, number of lines few more percent you will get enough fixed lines which you are looking for. So, at the end of the day you in our case when we look with two crop season maximum you can think of one year saving. It may be lot when you think about uh, many uh, cycles of, of uh, selection, but we uh, may, uh, maybe uh, uh, the, that if you on top of this you need to add a field uh, generation to get enough seed and that's that's where the balance starts to come out so so very often we are talking uh, six months loss you know from crossing to getting advanced lines okay a small scale breeding for selected crosses four generations in greenhouse people can manage you know uh, six is uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I hear uh, six, I'm already scared. You know, you lose the control unless you 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 know. In two generation, we lose control uh, sometime. You know, very hard to manage. You can imagine people six generation. Uh, uh, anyway, so we say, okay, let's. I want to do it. Okay, I want to do uh, so. I cannot plant everything on the same day and harvest everything on this uh, same time. So, you have to make a plan of planting weekly. So, you plant something this week, next week and this cycle will keep repeating. That is already you are losing something there, but I think you can still do, uh, we can uh, get through this uh, in one year without problem then you want to match our, uh, the time you come out of the greenhouse with the, your field cycle right uh, otherwise seed is sitting there anyway so uh, then we say okay so what infrastructure we will need so we don't have that infrastructure you know in one greenhouse you, you count I can't remember right now the number of plants we said okay in one greenhouse and the, what is the cost and all this was looked what kind of technical staff we, we will need, I need to you know either shut down half of my breeding program to do it or find funds to hire those five, six extra people who can uh, at least do part of the program. So, all these issues are going, we are, we are facing ourselves. Then issues come on the selection, uh, what do you lose by not selecting uh, the phenology and other thing came out uh, the uh, genetic gains uh, gain from time versus genetic gain from selection. Where do you weigh the two? So, on one side you are gaining, but other side you are losing right, because you did not select in some of the generations. And uh, we have uh, this, we use the Q gene program and uh, we have a close uh, 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 a guy working in China, Jian Kang Wang, he does a lot of uh, modeling for us. So, charge was given to him to model and he came up even with a slight advantage of selection in the field, you will need to, so let us say 9000 lines I am growing in the yield trial to be able to identify lines of similar value 9000. I have to, if I advance without selection, we need to increase that number by 100 fold. That is what comes out from the Q gene. 
So right now we are growing, you are thinking, uh, 70,000 uh, plots roughly, of which these 10,000 lines come. So you are talking 100 fold increase. That's what he says. Uh, I don't know whether it's true or not. Uh, uh, when you don't select, but I can imagine because a lot of plants which we select in the field. Anyway, so, so what we concluded that we need some uh, actual work, uh, uh, simulation is one thing, uh, uh, and, and look at the cost and gains. So we are developing now a facility at Taluka Research Station. We cannot use our nice greenhouses because the costs are too high. So we are looking at some abundant offices and the storage area converting that so we don't have to pay the high cost of running, you know. And, and the context where we are thinking and uh, we are, uh, still is uh, ongoing, the, the top one would be the rapid introgression of gene trait translocations in elite backgrounds to, uh, if we have some markers, it will help a lot uh, through partial back crossing. So if Matthew has a gene or uh, something, uh, uh, they identify a QTL and you want to quickly bring in a year time, less than a year time, this would be the ideal platform. So that's number one. But we still are not, uh, uh, have not given up this uh, uh, proof of concept breeding to determine genetic gain over the current method. So we will do that. And also the proof of concept genomic selection for uh, a selected low heritability traits. Uh, it could be diseases like fusarium and wheat blast. So these are some ideas under discussion once the facility is fixed. But this would be the, the top priority for us to start off. High throughput phenotyping in wheat breeding, you know, this is another thing uh, nowadays, a, a lot you hear. We have generated also a lot of data on this one to see how to progress. You can analyze, you can model. Uh, every yield trial plot has HTP data now for the last several years. And we are moving from there to these small uh, selection plots. You know, you see the light red paint. These are uh, our selection through uh, uh, what we see. But, and, and these kind of images you start to get uh, when you, you can fly planes or drones. They are flying all the time in Obregon. So uh, what we want to do here I don't think right now we are at a stage that uh, visual selection you can throw away and only go based on this. But most likely what uh, we might settle would be uh, uh, visual selection combined with NDVI or uh, if we get also hold on CTD which is great trait. But uh, as Matthew might have told you or not told you, depending on when it's taken and is it windy or field is irrigated, uh, if you don't do on the right time, it could g give you some uh, problems, you know. So, but NDVI is one which uh, is very straightforward uh, for large utilization. So, so this is where we are uh, thinking of integrating uh, this tool. Uh, studies are going on. Uh, uh, Margaret, will, how, I don't know how you are coming up, but this is small plot uh, versus large plot yield, etc., and etc. is all being looked now. So, uh, I think you heard a lot on the challenges of the genomic selection. We have to uh, see what, uh, I think some people who were probably not here in their context, uh, we had a, a very nice uh, project supported by USAID uh, through the uh, Feed the Future Initiative Innovation Lab uh, uh, and the project is through Kansas State University now in the fifth year, last year. Uh, 
and also it's a component in this DGGW project. Uh, so basically, all the lines in the first year yield trial have been genotyped, and I think it's now maybe 45, 46,000 lines. You can correct me, uh, Philomen, which have the cancer GBS marker data. However, looks like it is still not enough when you look at the predictions, because when you grow all these lines, we are only interested in this 10 to 15 percent of the uh, lines which are on the right side of the curve when in the yield distribution. The rest is garbage for us, year one, garbage. You cannot just say, hey, five minutes, yeah, I think I have one slide or two slides left. Yeah? So, so, predicted values are still not that great and as uh, Philomene said, if we use predicted value, we might be throwing close to 75 percent of the lines in this tail. So, so, we have to start to think what we have to do to improve the genomic uh, predictions and that is where discussion is going and uh, the loads of data. Eh? loads of data there. Maybe we have to improve the uh, marker platform. Talking about genetic diversity, I mean bottleneck you asked me, we think that may be a bottleneck, but not in wheat so far. In fact, in wheat when you make a cross, you find there is too much diversity. Our problem is how do you control that gen genetic diversity rather than create the diversity. There is so much variation all the time, but there are many ways you can keep uh, bringing new diversity in your gene pool. Uh, I, I think if we have to choose really, <laughs> but I, over the time I have learned if we can predict the winning cross combinations, rest you can manage because we make lots of crosses many do not give anything. Even though when the day I sit there and my colleagues sit there and we decide the cross, we think this cross is going to give good progeny, it does not happen. So, so this is where we should have get little bit more our work and yield stability is another trade. People say you cannot predict G by E, but I know some wheat lines year after year, year after year when you put as check, they are hard to be. So, they have genes and gene combinations which we are not able to unravel and we need to figure them out. So, these are some of the bottleneck, uh, how, what, which technology is going to help me, this is what we have to look. Hopefully, one day we can. Reducing the risks, I think number one, do not think of integrating many technologies together, that is one thing, you go slow, one by one try out. So, you, you need to evaluate the benefit, uh, how do you go about it, some place you can do outsourcing like marker platform, now marker outsourcing is the best. We need a pilot projects to optimize uh, uh, and by consulting with experts. And I think the other thing we also should be brave if adequate results are not obtained, either you are willing to refine it like we are uh, going to do with the genomic uh, selection to improve the prediction because I believe that is the way to go, but we are not there yet or abandon it move on. You cannot continue all your life with the same, uh, same thing. And I want to conclude by putting this, because I hear a lot that we can improve the, uh, increase the genetic gains. But I am kind of starting to think that maybe we already are at that point of around 1 percent, no matter which you crop you look, uh, no matter how much investment is, has been made now. And these are some of the reasons for young uh, people to think about uh, the complexity of genes. 
they, f uh, they think about the recombinations to bring the genes together. You make too many recombinants in wheat with three genome, you have nothing. But how how do you uh, how do you? And this is the big question, right? How do you increase yield uh, beyond one percent? Parents are very important. Uh, so parental breeding value did, uh, you only determine after rigorous phenotyping during multiple years. So many other steps which you want to do in any selection scheme can uh, cause you more problem. And with that, thank you for your interest, uh, sitting for an hour listening. <laughs> and maybe we have still a few minutes for question, right? <laughs>